Yeah, but just let me first start by saying thank you, Matthew, for giving me the opportunity to come here to visit your beautiful campus here in San Carlos and giving me a small window of summer in the month of December. This is really greatly appreciated. And again, of course, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about my chemi the chemistry that me and uh, several, a lot of other co good co-workers back in Denmark have performed together. So this is not the summary of the work I have done. This is a summary of a group of different people and it's joint efforts, really. So the topic I'll be summarizing, which um, today will be strategies and applications of asymmetric catalysis, which basically involves the different areas that Matthew summarized in about the research interests. Uh, so if you take the agenda for what I was going to talk about during the next couple of I don't know how long time it will be, but hopefully within the time limits for your dinner. Uh, first, I will be talking about, I mean, the main issue is asymmetric catalysis, uh, asymmetric organocatalysis. So I will talk about uh, one strategy where we use amino catalysis to create chemical diversity and diversity of uh, enantio-enriched chemical compounds. This is one. Afterwards, we will go from this more application uh, derived application target that um, uh, issue to go over to a more curiosity driven area which we name as uh, rem asymmetric remote functionalization using amino catalysis. It's basically a, a summary of some of the new concepts developed in recent year within asymmetric amino catalysis which we are currently still working at uh, with at Center for Catalysis. And due to the fact that this is a lot of curiosity driven research we want to understand a lot of the detail about these type of uh, these type of reactions so i will go into a bit more into detail with the mechanistic studies and computational work that we have been trying to to do to understand more about the reactivity pattern and the selectivity achieved using all of these chemistry and finally i will just go into some of my my small interests in in radical chemistry that we have been trying to do and of course the ultimate goal will be to do practical radical chemistry even in asymmetric catalysis, but we are not there yet. But on the road, we develop a couple small, nice projects. So I will just give you a small um, brief introduction into some of these reactions as well. So that's what I try will try to cover within the next amount of time. So, but just for people maybe outside the field of asymmetric catalysis, just let me re briefly summarize the essence of amino catalysis, which is not very much different from the essence of every other aspect of asymmetric catalysis, where you have activation and induction. The different modes of activation within amino catalysis I will go into in a minute, but just briefly about induction. of course, if you have a prochiral molecule without the, without the chiral environment, then basically the reactant can approach in two equal accessible ways, and you will have form a statistic distribution of your product. And the sense of stereo induction asymmetric catalysis is very simple. You either disfavor one side by putting a, a, a really a block or a steric bulk to disfavor that part. That would be like putting a roadblock on one of the, the, the roads on the fork road and forcing the guy to go walk the other along the other path. Or you can do something more smart and direct the approach of your reactant to your prochiral substrate, that would be something like putting up a road sign saying, pointing very favorably towards one of the, si one of the roads and hoping that the molecule or the guy walks towards that road. So this is basically the sense of asymmetric catalysis, which is also the sense of amino catalysis. Now, amino catalysis is a rapidly growing field. Uh, from around the year 2000 up to now, it's still growing. And for me, the main reason is that you've really found a good and complementary catalyst substrate pair within amine and carbonyl compounds, where you have a rapid and fast and reversible condensation hydrolysis equilibria, and you have good chemoselectivity uh, towards each other. And this basically founds, lays the foundation for amino catalysis, and it's all its development throughout the last 12, 13 years or so. 
a couple of typical, typical catalyst structures. I will, my, I will not go into this. This is developed by Professor Dave McMillan at Princeton at the moment. We are in our group using a lot of this type of polynol divided catalyst, which many of you guys might be very familiar with. And these are another type of catalyst uh, based on some natural products called synchona alkaloid, which I will go also talk a bit about in, in a minute. So these two activation modes, I talked about stereo induction. I will just briefly go through the activation modes of amino catalysis. These two are trivially named the yin and yang of amino catalysis, the founding principle of the two activation modes within uh, the use of amines as catalyst. First, you have N-amine activation, which basically forms the activation by formation of the car and carbon ion equivalent in the form of the N-amine species. In the presence of an electrophilic species, you will functionalize the alpha position of your product forming your alpha functionalized product. Uh, aminium ion activation, the other way around, if you have a alpha beta unsaturated compound, you will lure the low mo and you will uh, you will ac activate the beta position towards nucleophilic attack, and in the presence of a chiral catalyst, for example, some of the catalysts that we are using a lot based on st the principle of steric bulk, so that cow that was on the road, basically, you will see that you will be able to block one of the roads or one of the passes efficiently, and you will have attack or approach of your re reactant from the other position. So this is basically what uh, is the founding, two of the founding pillars within amino catalysis. Now, this type of chemistry, it was well developed up to 2005, 2006, which was the time I started in the research group. So at that time, a lot of other groups and we and people in, in our group, we were thinking about how do we proceed with this type of chemistry? How do we go on? Because more or less every single atom that you can put on alpha position or on the beta position has been published already. So one of the ways that we thought about going was into diver diversity oriented synthesis. Uh, using something called one-pot reactions, which is not something new, completely new, but it's, it's done in, in, on industrial scale. It's also done in laboratories, which is basically performing multiple transformations in one pot without intermediary purifications. Now, nature and cells do it all the time. They don't purify, because they have, but they have the luxury of having compartments for different types of reactions. In, as a, in a laboratory, in a flask type chemistry, we don't have that kind of luxury. So the sense is to find reactions which is are compatible and reliable that have functioned together without uh, decomposition, without erosion of EE, and so on and so on. And amino catalysis actually works very well in this sense because amino catalysis is a very robust type of uh, act activation mode. So one pot reactions for uh, amino catalyzed one pot reaction where we try to diverse, uh, create diversity of enantiomer enriched products. I will show you two very simple principles in doing so. One, we take one or maybe two very specific organocatalytic reactions and merge it with very different transformations. Um, and the outcome is, of course, via the first the same organocatalytic reaction, you will form amplification by catalysis where you can choose the different substituent of choice. The second part will be different type of reaction where you really can add diversity. So amplification by transformations, you can really create very different type of structures. And I'm only showing some of the work that I've been participating in. Other people in the group have done much, other, much more work on this topic. The second strategy, which is very trivial, you reverse the things, now you, cr you merge different, as many as possible organocatalytic reactions, and merge it with one specific transformation of interest. And that will give you still diverse functional groups in different places, but with one common functional group. Uh, and we were focusing on the terminal alkyne due to its wide applicability in basically all type of areas of, chem of science, not only chemistry. So these two simple strategies, I will try to show you how much diversity in an anti enriched synthesis uh, you can get. So the first thing, merging one or two reactions with different transformations. We're talking about a epoxidation or azidination reaction of alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyl compounds. And the choice for this is basically, if you look at these products, intermediates, you have several electrophilic sites. 
that makes them very versatile, a very versatile uh, chiral framework, and you do different type of modifications on this. And I think also one of the, the reasons for success is this aldehyde group, it's able to bridge different uh, nucleophilic species or polynucleophilic species into proximity, um, act basically also activating the epoxide over here, uh, making, intramolec making intramolecular reactions into intramolecular reactions afterwards. So I think this is, uh, this is more or less the reason why we have been pretty successful with this strategy. Now, if we just take the general mechanism of this reaction, it's pretty simple. It's a combination of aminimine activation and enamine activation that I talked about earlier. You have the formation of aminimion where you have a nucleophilic species with a leaving group attacking under the, guide, under the guidance of a chiral catalyst, this approach will occur selectively. Afterwards, you have formation of the three-member ring by kicking out the leaving group. You form this catalyst-bound aminium ion species. Upon hydrolysis, you liberate your catalyst, and you form the product. And to add a twist of to this reaction, we, our group and some of my colleagues recently published a paper stating that this product for the epoxidation reaction actually acts uh, to accelerate the rate of the reaction because it functions as a phase transfer catalyst taking the hydrogen peroxide from the aqueous layer into the organic layer by the formation of a uh, hydroxy uh, peroxy acetal kind of structure. And that accelerates the reaction uh, of the epoxidation catalytic cycle go completely. So, but this is the basic uh, reaction which was developed in 2005. We were only talking about merging this with other temporal transformations to generate diversity. So the first reaction we published, I think we started to work on this in 2008, uh, was simply uh, after the epoxidation reaction, we add in a simple base and simple nucleophile nitroacetate. What we get is these isoxazoline enoxide products in reasonable yield moderate DR, and always excellent enantioselectivity. If you look at the starting materials and over here, and look at the product, you really add on a lot of layers of complexity. And you can also tune a, a lot of different groups to create diversity in this application. Now, it works like, like a simple mechanism. You have an Henri type reaction. Afterwards, you have deprotonation and O-alkylation opening the epoxide, forming your, the, the thermodynamic most stable product, which is this one, major diastomer, Falcon on product, a minor is the other one. You will have the, the DR, we try to optimize it um, for up to a year's time, which was not possible. But I think for the first case, to prove the concept, this was a reasonable result to get for this type of products. And we also showed that this product, you had some different synthetic applicability. You can deoxygenate, you can reductively cleave the ring to very rapidly form some of these polyfunctionalized uh, protected amino esters uh, in reasonable good yields, and these are opti unoptimized yields. Now, if you want to increase the diversity level further, you can add another step in the one pot sequence. You can add, a, uh, add, for example, a nitrogen species or a benzyl amine in this case, forming your amine, forming your an amine upon which you do the same reaction sequence. And now instead of an oxygen molecule, uh, oxygen functionality here, you can have an amine instead. So that adds an additional layer of, of uh, diversity in this approach. This was the first case, and we thought, okay, maybe we can do something else. Try to work on different type of transformations to add different layers. And this was one of the, um, uh, the papers that followed. If you look at, again, I mean, I'll focus you on the starting material and on the product. That is formally a dihydroxylation of the, the, the alkene, at the same time protecting your aldehyde group uh, as a dimethyl acetal. And the only additional thing you add is sodium methoxide commercial available or very cheap to prepare. This is the only thing that you add in room temperature. You go from such structures like this to something like this within hours. Now, if you do, instead of epoxidation reaction, you do a xerination reaction, and you do the same trick with sodium methoxide, you'll get these four-membered azetidine rings, which is formally still an amino hydroxylation of the initial double bond and a different type of protecting of your uh, aldehyde functionality. The mechanism is 
also pretty trivial. You have, again, the aldehyde is the first electrophilic species to be attacked by sodium methoxide. It will initiate some kind of pain type rearrangement. And this is still a acetyl uh, type of functionality, so you'll be able to push open it to form a positive species here. This one now you have methoxide and you have the nitrogenated species. Uh, and, and depending on if you have OH or you have an N-tosyl, NH-tosyl group, you'll form these two different products. Uh, but all in all, you always form them in reasonable amount of yield as a single di more or less as a single diisomer and excellent EE every single time. I mean, this is a very simple way to get these really highly functionalized compounds. 